Good morning. So, we were, I actually just came back from East Africa. <laughs> we were living in West Africa for about 18 years. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ellen and I have been with Converge since about 1998. We ended up going to Cameroon, West Africa in 2001. And to live with, um, to work in a hospital actually, and uh, to work with the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Board, I went as a advisor to the technical services. I used to have a construction company up in northern central Massachusetts and did a lot of medical work. And Ellen had her own house cleaning business. And when we get to Cameroon, God had all kinds of different ideas for us. Ellen started uh, teaching some kids to read, which developed into a school which still exists to this day. Um, many of her students have gone on to university. Um, she had a lot of fruit in her ministry, my own, um, <laughs> not so much. Um, but I realized um, after we were there for a while that when we look at underdeveloped countries, we kind of look at people and say, you know what, those people need some stuff and we need to give them some things and we need to send them money or we need to go and do things for them. But after we got there and were there for a while, I began to realize that there was a lot of people that were just not reaching their potential as God had created them to be. And that there was a reason for that. Um, we saw the country was very rich in natural resources and human resources. Uh, in fact, uh, just recently we did five leadership conferences, one in Kenya and four in Uganda. They were like back to back. And um, it was very exhausting, but it was also very rewarding. And, it, and one of the things that I'll show you today um, is a thing that I had learned from a person who was a mentor for me. It's kind of how God created us in his image and what that actually means. And I had mentioned this resource thing uh, to this group of church leaders, and I said, you do realize that you're, you're human resources. And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, we'll get to that. But... The thing that holds back most of these, uh, the development of these countries is the fact that people don't live godly lives. God gave us a way to live. He gave us a way to behave. That means how to do business, how to do politics, all of those things, how to engage life. And uh, as humans, we have a sinful nature, and a lot of times we don't obey the rules. We wander off the path and we pay the consequences for it. So I'm going to share a little bit about... Um, what we've been doing as a result of that. So we had to leave Cameroon um, 2017 because of civil unrest. In fact, it's, uh, we, we stuck it out for about a year. Uh, then they shut down the schools. The, uh, they call themselves the Amba Boys. They want to secede and become their own country. They want nothing to do with the government. In fact, they just went through a three and a half month lockdown um, in the area where we lived, the hospital was struggling to pay their staff. Taxis couldn't move. There was no food. I mean, it was really difficult, and it's still difficult today. And um, so before we left, based on what I was saying earlier, I met a lot of government people, a lot of government officials with my work, and um, a lot of people who were Christians, but they didn't behave like Christians. We ended up going through some court cases, and we found that if you have money, you can get justice, which... In that case, it really isn't justice anymore. Um, but we, we began to understand that most of these people went to church. They claimed to be Christians. They were in church on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, they lived very differently. So there wasn't any transformation going on in their lives. So we had uh, started a, uh, an integrity group. A few people that I had met, people in positions of influence. We had a meeting at our house in, in 2016, about uh, 12 people. Most of them had never met each other prior to meeting in our living room this day, and uh, these guys were really excited. I mean, there were people who wanted to live for Christ. They wanted to be honest in their workplaces, but because of corruption um, being so lucrative, a lot of people make a lot of money with it. So if somebody wants to be straight, um, you will not be appreciated. So now they had people that could support each other. And then um, all of a sudden, the civil crisis started at the end of 2016. And like I said, we stuck it out for about a year. Um, 
we heard gunfire all the time, machine gun fire, and finally we said, you know what, let's go back for uh, early home assignment and maybe in a year things will calm down, we'll go back. Well, that was, uh, what, six years ago. Still going strong. Um, so when we left, um, I was actually feeling kind of depressed because, I mean, we were really excited about what was developing as a ministry. And it had, it, this had developed over many years of interaction with people, gaining an understanding of the culture, uh, the education system because of Ellen's school, and putting together a lot of different pieces um, to the puzzle as to why development wasn't happening. So we had to go to Germany um, in 2017. And Converge had this thing where they had missionaries from Africa, Europe, and the Mediterranean area all kind of came together. And while we were there, people were coming up and saying, oh, they want to build a, a school in Togo. Maybe you can go and help with that. Or they want to build a clinic in Abidjan. Maybe you can go help with that. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not what I want to do. I don't really feel called to that because this whole um, integrity thing or helping people become the people that God created them to be, um, was really something that I believe God had put in my heart. And, but now I was wondering, how am I going to do this? So does anybody here know John and Karen Ames? They was uh, from uh, in Norfolk. He's actually our supervisor now in the Africa Impact Team. So while we were in Germany, um, this whole idea came up and said, well, why don't you join the Africa Impact Team? And John and Karen came and had lunch with us in Winchester one day, and I was kind of lamenting on the fact that everything in Cameroon seemed to have collapsed. And Karen said, well, maybe uh, God wants to do, do something and use this in a broader context. So on this picture that I have on the screen, you'll see a bunch of stars there now. So God is spreading this across Africa. This is pretty cool. And, uh, and the, one of the reasons why I was uh, really enjoying my time here today um, is because I really like this church. You guys, uh, through Laura, has been like always asking for prayer requests. Um, you people actually care about what we're doing. And it's not like we're important or anything, but as I was sharing earlier, if a church is giving money to something, you need to care about it, or you should be caring about it, because you're giving that to the Lord's work and you should want to know how it's being used. And so, I, yeah, I just really was excited when we had the opportunity to come here. I wanted to really meet you guys face to face and just thank you for your prayer support. And, uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of boasting after the end of this. And uh, we, we had a story, um, request for stories from our mission director. And we had like this town hall thing about two weeks ago. And he's saying, don't be afraid to share stories of what's going on. And he said, one of our missionaries came up and said, well, you know, I feel kind of funny. It's like bragging. And he, he says, I looked at him and I said, what? He says, you're not even doing it. This is God's work. So I said, you know what? That's right. And uh, so we're in this together. So we're going to boast a little bit together today. So you can take joy in the things that the Lord is doing because it wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for, you, for what you've been doing. So I've been in uh, Liberia a couple of years ago. Um, in early 2020, just before the COVID thing came. And all these things were going on in my head. And I, so I, I gave some presentations to a group of a bunch of deacons and business people over a course of a couple of days. And at the end of it, one of the guys who was there stood up and looked at me and he pointed his finger and he says, you need to go and write this down so we can teach this to other people because I've ne we've never heard anything like this before. It actually gives us hope. I was kind of talking about development and in God's word. So I went back and um, I started to make a list of things that, you know, like topics that I wanted to fill out. And two years later, I had a book. So the book is kind of an accident, but uh, it wasn't intention. I didn't set out to write that. But now it's actually been printed in Liberia and Cameroon. It's being printed hopefully next week in Cameroon in French, where uh, I had another missionary friend who actually grew up in the DRC as a missionary kid, which is a French speaking country. And then her and her husband served in Central African Republic for 30-something years as a doctor and nurse. So they speak Africanized French very well. And so it's a real blessing for her to translate the book. So it'll be going to CAR in northern uh, Congo, uh, the, the, <coughs> the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then also I'm working with a group of lawyers down in Bukavu, which is on the east side of Congo, who want to start an integrity group. 
And then we were just in Kenya, where I met uh, a man uh, and another pastor. And when we got there, they're talking about integrity and God's word. And when we're not following it, and John looks at him and says, hey, he's speaking your language. So I got a connection in Kenya now, and uh, he's asked me to come back. He wants to bring together a group of government leaders. Um, and see if they can start an integrity group there. From there, we went to Uganda and uh, stopped and met a guy who was going to be a um, general overseer of a, of a big, kind of a charismatic denomination, uh, and was a cousin of the pastor that we were meeting. So while we're talking, he starts talking about corruption and integrity and God's word and the connection. And so God's kind of moving all over in this same theme. So it's kind of cool to see how, you know, all these years of, of bringing this thought together and this kind of coalescing with these different leaders in different countries. So we're spreading right across Africa with the Africa Impact Team. So John and I were there kind of tag teaming, um, doing leadership conferences, talking about light shining in the darkness. And uh, so I'm kind of a science guy and a technical type person. And um, oh, I want to bring up this guy as well. So this might be another potential trip, this guy in Zambia, Lennox Kalafungwa, who was with the African Christian University. And he had actually uh, posted something on Facebook. This is uh, several months ago. And uh, he and I had become kind of good friends. And this is kind of right along the same theme. And this was his post. He says, sometime last week I posted something regarding law and politics. And someone replied to me saying that I should exclusively focus on the gospel and nothing else. I see this as a problem because it insinuates that Christ is sovereign over, only over our hearts and nothing else. We need concerted efforts to apply theology into every aspect of life. I don't know if you've ever heard of Abraham Kuyper. He was a theologian, Dutch theologian. He said one time, he said, there is not a square inch of our lives in this earth that Jesus does not declare is mine. So God wants to know, uh, be can, in control of everything in our lives. So the verse, um, which has already been read, but there's a couple of things I want to point out in here. One thing is when light shines on something, it becomes visible, right? So if... It was night, all the lights were off, I could be standing there, you could be sitting here, and you would not be able to see me because there's no light shining on me. And then it talks about the light of Christ shining on us. So I want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, you cannot actually see me even now. Did you know that? Even though I'm standing here, you do not see me. It's because what you're seeing is the way your eyes work, and this is really cool. So as I get in off of these science tangents, I actually have a bunch more slides, but I cut it down to one. So the way it works, and what's interesting about eyesight too, if, and if anybody ever talks to you about evolution and struggles with evolution, the, the whole evolutionary idea is that something has like this, this kind of uh, a mistake happens genetically, and it turns out to be a positive thing, so it keeps it and passes it on. But the problem with eyesight is there's like five different things involved in that. I read a thing years ago about how some single-celled thing got a dark spot on it that could sense light, and then all of a sudden say, hey, I think I'll develop an eye out of this over the next few million years, which is kind of insane. But what happens is as light shines in our eyes, it hits our retina, generates some electrical impulses that go through our optic nerve, and what we actually see is taking place in our brain. It's not even in our eyes. It's like our eyes are like a camera that are actually picking it up. So there's actually, this is actually in that verse. When the light shines on something, we can now see it. It becomes visible. So my whole thing behind this is that once Christ's light shines in our life, as followers of Jesus, we can now reflect his light. Now, does anybody here ever had a makeup mirror or anything like that? I remember years ago, you used to make makeup mirrors used to have like different types of light shining on them so that a woman knowing that where she was going to be could put the appropriate light because her makeup would look different under different light. So the things that reflect have reflective properties. And those properties reflect certain light, they're designed to reflect certain colors. 
but at the same time, it's also dependent on the type of light that's shining on it. I did a thing with a prism because I wanted to bring this to Uganda, and uh, I took one of these LED flashlights I have at home and shone it into the prism, and it made a refraction, but only two colors. And I thought, this is really interesting because when we see a rainbow, it gives us the whole spectrum of visible light. And I started thinking about this, and, and I put this, so God created different people with different skills and different gifts, and he's given us different qualities which we can use now to reflect a picture of God in our own little way. And as we come together as a church with a different gift, I kind of show this kind of in reverse with all the different colors coming into the prism and coming out with that pure light kind of in reverse of what happens. So we can give the world a much better picture of Jesus as we each exercise our different gifts and reflecting the, with the properties that God has endowed us with, our little spectrum of light that he's given us. Tracking with me? <laughs> I just kind of really get into this stuff. So. <laughs> so I got a couple more verses here that I kind of used. They're all connected again. Um, and there's just a few things that I wanted to, uh, to see this. So this is kind of a condensation of four days worth of talks into like, what time do you normally get out of here? Okay, two o'clock. That's great. I'll probably have to go about 10, 15 minutes overtime. Thanks. <laughs> so Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So there's a couple of things that we see in this verse. One, that, that humans bear God's image. And have you ever wondered what that means? I mean, I've heard a lot of different people over the years speculating that, wow, there's like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there's three different things. But um, I think it goes more into qualities that we have and abilities and gifts that he's given us. And the second thing is that men and women are designed for a purpose, for a grand goal. Men and women partner together to produce offspring to carry forward God's image and his goal again for humans. And now even though these goals are still in place, the world is different than it was when he first created Adam and Eve when things were perfect. Now things are kind of broken, so sin makes life uh, a bit challenging. Jeremiah 29.7 Seek the welfare of the city where you live, where I've sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. One of the things that came up in, uh, in our topic when John was talking about that we as, as, as followers of Jesus are not citizens of this world, right? We're citizens of heaven. We talk about that. And at this point in time, the, the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. So they weren't home either. They weren't where they were supposed to be. But God was telling them that while you were there, Live in a way that is going to be good for you, because what's good for you is also good for where you're living. So a couple of points in there. Every person who has not passed on to be with Christ lives somewhere on this earth. And while we are living in that place, Jesus has called us to be salt and light, spreaders of the gospel, and influencers for righteousness that should be aimed at glorifying God and drawing others to Christ. It's also important to note, and this I brought up in, um, um, in Cameroon, because a lot of times, not Cameroon, but Uganda and Kenya, and even here, because a lot of times we talk about good works, about helping people and doing those type of things, and I think we're very limited if we think about, you know, raking somebody's yard as doing a good work or going shopping for somebody, because Jesus said that we'll be persecuted for righteousness' sake, for doing good works. Peter, in uh, Peter chapter 3, talks about good works and how you will be persecuted for good works, and he specifically talks about that. So it's important, to, though, to understand that righteous behavior and good works is not the gospel. It's not the same thing as sharing the gospel. However... These things in God's people's lives should be evidence that something has happened to us, that we've been transformed. We are now uh, changed people, becoming more like Christ. Then Matthew 6.33, this is the last one here, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. 
So this is very important, especially in the African context, because the prosperity gospel has like ripped across the continent. And so many people now are drawn into these churches where they see these pastors who are making big money. There was one guy in Nigeria who recently passed away who had a private jet. Um, I mean, these people have tons of money. So they invite people into the church and say, hey, God wants you to be rich and just keep giving money to me. And eventually you might get rich too. And, uh, but it draws a lot of people. And also at the end of this, I, I took some pictures of mosques in Uganda. I was shocked at the amount of mosques there are in Kenya. As we were driven from, I mean, uh, Uganda, right? See what happens when you get old and go to two different places, you get kind of mixed up. So as we were driving from um, Kinshasa out to Jinja, there was, um, along this road, there was just a lot of series of villages, like endless development. Um, and there was probably two mosques in every village. I could I lost count. I mean, they were just everywhere. And so I was asking this pastor, Asaf, who I'll mention after, um, you know, how did, is there a lot of people in these mosques? He said, the mosques are full. And I said, but why do they go there? He said, well, they give free food and they give money. And so people have this idea, especially people, and this is, you know, Satan targets people who are materially poor because they want something better for themselves. And they think that somebody's going to give it to them. And I believe that we as the Western Church are partly responsible for that in the fact that we love to give people stuff and we do it out of a generous heart but it has communicated a message to people that somehow they're not capable of ever developing a, a, a better quality of life that somehow it has to come from somewhere else and so that's why they've they when we got to camera we felt very uncomfortable for us very difficult to make good friends because everybody came with an ulterior motive like maybe I can get something from these people and uh, I actually found it to be quite disturbing um, that you know you get to be seen as like money or walking money with an opportunity we used to get these letters on a regular basis and you know some are legitimate and the Bible does tell us that we ought to help people who are in need um, but that's not God's goal for people. One of the things I shared, um, and, and Pastor Asaf, uh, he's just become this great friend. Um, he repeated this several times if I didn't repeat it. But I said, when God created humanity, there was two people, Adam and Eve. He didn't create like a group of people over here and say, okay, you people now, you're going to be the poor people. And I'm going to create a group of people over here. and You'll be the rich people. And your job is to take care of those people. Because that completely flies in the face of Scripture, which is written to everybody, and uh, talks about us being productive. I'll get into that a little bit too. But one of the reasons I, I put that, this here is that it implies that there is something required of mankind in order to enjoy the full blessings of God. We can't just like sit at home expecting that somebody's going to come and deliver us free groceries. We were created to be productive. We were created to work and to participate in. Um, finishing his creation in the beginning to go and develop the world but to be clear um, God's covenants with his people have never been transactional it's not a thing and this is how this prosperity gospel works that you have to do something in order to get something God's grace to us wouldn't be grace if we had to earn it if we had to do things in order to to do that God cares for his people However, he's given us rules to live by, where blessings can be greater if we obey them. Unfortunately, individuals can suffer because of greater societal lifestyle and culture. You think about the things that are happening in the United States today, how we have wandered off the path of the Bible. I mean, it started decades ago where they stopped prayer in schools and they've slowly been chipping away at morality, the things that are on television now, it just blows my mind. But at the same time, there's a cost to that. And, uh, and as a society, and uh, there's a great book, if you ever want to read it, by Eric Metaxas called A Letter to the American Church. He talks about a lot of this. But he feels, and I kind of feel too, that as a church, we have been silent. We have not wanted to cause waves because we want to let people think that, well, we love them, but Jesus said you'll be persecuted for good works. And a lot of times good works means standing up for the truth, standing up for righteousness and doing the right thing, even in, when people are expecting different. 
So we can, per and then again, we can personally create our own issues in our own lives. If we do things that are foolish or whatever, we can live with consequences. So there are consequences to walking outside of God's laws and principles in our lives. We began to realize in some time through Ellen's school and things that happened there, through different court cases that we went to in Cameroon, and um, you know, we were asked to constantly be paying, paying bribes. Uh, the court cases, we had to keep pushing them because nobody really cared. We went through a case uh, where there was over 30 children who were molested, one of them, four of them were our house helpers' kids. One of them was their little girl. I mean, I was like infuriated. And so that morning when I found that out, I looked at Gladys, our house helper, her mother, and I said, well, what, are, what are you gonna do? And she looked at me and says, what can I do? I'm poor. I mean, that just devastated me too. So we ended up bringing them to the gendarmerie, which is the local uh, government police. And they looked at me like, yeah, so? <laughs> So we just kept pushing this thing and pushing this thing. And nine months um, later, we went to court, I don't even know how many times, and uh, finally get this guy got convicted and developed uh, some good relationships. But I began to realize that the reason why Cameroon and other countries like that don't develop and why countries like the United States were starting to actually go in reverse a bit is it's connected to how we live with God's word in our lives, if we're honest or whatever. Not, not being subjective to circumstances and feelings and all these other things. So we began to realize that these people in positions of influence in Cameroon who were in church every Sunday, um, there was no transformation taking place in their lives. They were going through the motions, they were very religious people, but there was definitely something missing in their life. And so we realized that there is a, uh, a definite connection between discipleship and development. You can't buy disciple, uh, development for anybody, and you can't give it to them. Um, it depends on how they live with what they have, because these countries are rich. I mean, natural resource rich um, and human resource rich. So the only thing missing is that connection between living uh, godly with what, uh, what they've been given. And many people are trying, but there's a lot of force going against them. So I wanted to touch just briefly here on culture, because a lot of times when we think of culture, we think of clothing, styles, food, and music, but culture is very deep. Culture is how we think, it's our worldview. It impacts how we make decisions, what's right, what's wrong, what's funny, what's not funny. Um, I tend to joke around a lot, and, uh, and I actually had to work hard at a couple of people in Cameroon because I, I found it difficult not to joke around sometimes, so I had to kind of train them to laugh. Um, but one day I needed some money for something and I, um, I had sent a text to our finance administrator, Hans, and uh, I was a wonderful young man, we became good friends. And uh, he wrote back and said, sure, no problem, go ahead and order that. So I wrote back and said, Hans, you're all right, I don't care what anybody says about you. Two minutes later, I read a text. Why, what are they saying? So, I had to go up to his office and explain, Hans, that was a joke, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's uh, I, uh, constantly learning, you know, uh, that when you interact with people, our languages are so idiomatic. I mean, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head, um, but there is nothing on top of my head, right? But in most cultures, if you said that, and, and it's a common saying that we say, we all know what that means, but people would be looking at your head like, I don't see anything up there. So that's a, a reason why you talk about Bill and, uh, praying for Bill and Kathy and um, in Senegal and, and other places where people are doing Bible translation, how it's so important. Most of the people in Uganda go to school and they learn to speak English, but they have their own tribal languages that are their heart language that they grow up in, and that's how they think in, and that's where their culture operates in that, in that range, in that, that cultural language. So we had translators. Um, translating for us um, while we were giving this. Even though people could hear us and understand the English, they got to the deeper meanings of what we were actually trying to say. So it was really important and it was a, a great blessing in, both in Kenya and there um, to be able to explain what we meant, so targeting those uh, type of people. But uh, culture includes group skills, knowledge, attitudes, values, motives, why we do what we do, what's right, what's wrong. 
And most of these things, we don't go like to culture school. We just learn it as we grow up and we hang around with people in our own culture. So the attitudes, values, and beliefs that we collectively call culture have an unquestionable role in human behavior. So I, I put this slide in there because an important thing to note is that institutions that develop or operate within a society for obvious reasons, are gonna reflect the cultural values, right? People are who they are and they take who they are to work and they use those. So as our morality has slowly been becoming more and more subjective to circumstance and business schools now they teach, if it's legal and defensible in court, it's okay. In other words, I could make you a promise and break it, but if it's not written down, nothing you can do about it. But at the same time, that has a cost. We lose trust. Why, why, when you get some software now, you have to say, I accept, and you get a 14-page thing that you're supposed to read? Uh, because nobody trusts anybody anymore. And that's all because our culture has become very subjective. But when people behave like that, culturally, and uh, in big man culture, like in Africa, if you don't pay the judge, you're not going to get a good decision. There was a judge in that, that a, a case that we had gone through with those kids, and I got to know him over nine months many times, and he started telling me about all the wonderful things that he and his wife are doing. They're wonderful Christian people. They're helping widows and doing these different projects. And um, we talked, made a special arrangements to go and talk to him about this whole integrity thing. So we had a Muslim that lived, he owned uh, 95,000 acres of land behind our hospital huge amount of land. He's the richest man in Cameroon. Um, I got connected to him because he had a technical issue, and um, we just kind of became friends. Now, if you Google him, he's wanted by, I mean, all kinds of UN and everything for crimes against humanity, but for some reason he liked me. Um, I, I helped him come up with a design for an electrical thing one day. We were sitting in his house. I gave him a little presentation. I brought the engineers from the U.S. up there who had come out for our hydro plant to look at his, and uh, he was just so grateful for that. He looked at me and says, Tommy, he says, I can't believe all the time you put into helping me with this. And I saw, I was sitting next to him on his couch, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Al-Haji, you're my neighbor. The Bible says I'm to love my neighbor as yourself. I mean, he just lit up. And, uh, but one day I was up there for a, a meeting with him and another guy, and they told us to wait kind of behind his house. And so off to the right, there was like this little bench, and there was a guy sitting there with a duckbill hat pulled down over his head and just like this little windbreaker on. And uh, someone from the house came and waved him over. And so he had to walk like right by us. And as I was looking, he looks like this. And he says, oh, hi, Mr. Shatanis. He was that judge. I mean, I, I was like absolutely floored. And uh, he went in the back door. Five minutes later, he came out the front door, went up and got a taxi. I had never seen this guy outside of having a private vehicle and a driver and in a suit and tie. And I was just devastated. But that's just another piece that kind of put into the, the puzzle I put together. Here's a guy who claimed to be a Christian, yet um, here he was taking bribes on cases of justice. Now, we know God is a God of justice. God loves justice. He hates injustice. Another verses I came across in Proverbs about the six things that God hates, the seven that are abomination. And I get to thinking, you know, we're always encouraged. We need to love the things that God loves. And uh, I said, but we're not encouraged to hate the things that God hates. And would that not make a difference in the way I view something? Uh, the Apostle Paul said that love what is good and abhor what is evil. He didn't say, well, kind of look the other way if you don't like it. But if we hate something, we're definitely going to get more involved, right? Like abortion and these other things. And I know there are churches that I've heard that say, well, we don't want to talk about that. But it's right there in the Bible. And so you can't claim to be preaching the whole counsel of God and then pick and choose the, the things that you want to stand up for or the things that you want to ignore. So this transformation, Romans 12, too, has kind of become this, this kind of a a theme verse through these integrity groups. So basically, the Apostle Paul is saying, don't be conformed to this world. In other words, we're born with a culture. We grow up in a culture. And all cultures are, have good parts to them, and they also have bad parts to them. 
But here he's telling us, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We're supposed to be studying God's word, and if we see something that comes into conflict with the way we think, we're supposed to change that. One of the biggest challenges that Ellen and I had, we had Bible studies a lot with the people that we worked with. And it was very interesting because if we came to a, a point in a study where something that kind of conflicted with a, a cultural value, we'd have this lively discourage and then, uh, I mean discussion, and then all of a sudden they would look at us and say, well, you know what? You don't understand because you're not from here. So that was another factor that came into this, that you have to find those people that are critical thinkers, uh, godly people, and working with them, then they can go back to those other people where they don't have that cultural uh, barrier. So in Uganda, we met, uh, that's John Ames and myself, and uh, Asaf and his wife, Jackie. Asaf is a really special guy. Um, I had asked for prayer before we went, um, and he is an answer to prayer. He is 36 years old, has three young kids. He was being mentored by one of these prosperity gospel um, pastors. And one day he got a connection. I still haven't put this together. This guy from Virginia was doing this leadership Bible study thing and going through this um, timeline of salvation through the Bible. And this guy was just seriously hit by that, by the Lord, and just said, you know what, we've got this totally wrong. And so he's been doing that. And so a couple of years ago, this John Ames met this guy, and he said, you need to meet this guy, Asaf. So John had been there twice before, and then this time was my first time for meeting him. And so, um, yeah, we just, uh, this guy is just, uh, thinks a lot like me. So I was talking about the, the being created in God's image thing. This <clears throat> friend of mine, Dr. Bob Osborne, has written a couple of books, and the second one is Developing Redemptive Change Agents. He works with uh, PhD students. Um, he's actually retired now from the University of Minnesota, but he still has this organization called the Wilberforce International Institute, where they work with um, foreign students who are at the PhD level and who are believers to train them to be able to go back to their home countries as transformational uh, agents of, of change. And uh, one day I was coming out of my office at the hospital in Cameroon and I saw this young woman across the hall talking to a guy in a purchasing department. I recognized her. She had come to the U.S. to go to school. She had got her master's at uh, Southern uh, Theological Seminary. Then she went to the University of Minnesota and got a Ph.D. in uh, child education where she met Bob Osborne. So we just kind of got talking and I was talking to her about this uh, integrity idea that was now beginning to develop in my mind, and I had been recommended this book called um, uh, Taming the Beast, Can We Bridle This Culture of Corruption? And she looks at me, she says, you read that book? And I said, yeah. She says, the author is my mentor. And so I got an email from him a couple of days later. So he has been very instrumental. In fact, he was the one that got me these contacts in the DRC. So the Lord works through all kinds of people creating these networks. So it's been very exciting. So he put together this thing, and this just really resonated with me. Um, so I'm just going to go through this quick. But if you look at the bottom, God has given us four intrinsic capacities as human beings when he created us. He created us to be moral beings. He gave us the ability to know right from wrong. Not necessarily his idea of right and wrong, but we have an inbuilt knowledge that there is a right and a wrong. Then he created us as rational beings. We can think, we can solve problems, we can do all kinds of amazing things with our minds. And these are all qualities that he shared with us of his own being. He created us to be social beings, to live in community. He created churches to be communities. And he also created us as spiritual beings. And all people are spiritual beings, but the Bible says that we are born spiritually dead until we accept Christ and, and are then brought to light. Um, brought into the light and brought to life. And so now we have that capability of reflecting Christ's light. So the issue here is, is that morality is impacted by our spiritual uh, maturity, right? I mean, we, as we begin to get transformed. But all people have these um, abilities, even people who are not believers. And so some people use these very same capacities for their own benefit. 
The next one up is God created us to be productive. He gave us functional capacities. He made us to be responsible. God is responsible. And he gave us the ability to be creative. I mean, people write songs. I mean, you just look at the world. We create things. You think about all the inventions that happen because God gave us these rational minds and creativity. But these are all qualities that God has given us that he wants to use um, to reflect Christ's life. So, I mean, if you're a lawyer, be a godly lawyer. If you're a doctor, we should be a godly lawyer. If you're a janitor, we should be a godly janitor. And everything that we do, we have an opportunity to do it in a Christ-like way or in a way that our culture would kind of expect us to behave. And those are the things that are either going to be shining light, well, always, they should always be shining light, but sometimes it might bring some reproach on us as well. People might not be happy about the fact that you're acting godly, but Jesus and Peter both said, just take it and keep going. That's kind of how we're supposed to do that. And then he gave us two purposes. And the first one was actually to produce goods and services. He created Adam and Eve. He was supposed to work the garden. We can imagine how it would have gone if they hadn't sinned. Um, they probably would have had a lot less difficulties as things were going, but we know what happened. And so when sin came into the world, then uh, the need for protection came into the world. But a lot of times we think about just protecting the environment and those things, but there's many things that need to be protected. There's children in Cameroon who are abused and don't have anybody to advocate for them or to stand up for them. Um, there are many opportunities that we have to, um, to be protectors of God's good creation in many different ways. That's, um, we're called to make sure that we preach good doctrine, correct people who are wrong. And all of these things that we do are designed for a human's supreme goal, which is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so we can use those that way, or we cannot use those that way. And sometimes, you know, we go forward a few steps and we come a step back, but God is gracious and keeps moving us ahead. So this is something that actually had a, a, lot, a great impact um, in, in, in East Africa this time when I was just there. And in fact, that one place where those pastors were looking at me when I said, you know, you do realize that your resources... And they sh I said, and when I finished with this part of the thing, I said, you do realize your resources? They said, yes, we are. And uh, I did another thing called on spiritual capital about how we can make, uh, we can give value to so many things in life. When we act in a godly way, we can make life just better um, for, for people to be around. Uh, that's called generating spiritual capital. But it's also um, something that make Christ attractive to people. We're supposed to be ornaments on the gospel. People are supposed to look at us and we should be, you know, promoting um, this, this thing that makes people want to know Christ because of the way that we see um, how we behave. So this is, uh, again, where Asaf, this is him. We, um, before I burned up my projector, he was kind of helping, um, and he got hung up on some of these points. I mean, he really got into this thing, uh, and, I, and I really enjoyed that. But he was explaining to the people all, all the uh, different points in some of these presentations. So how do we glorify God in a practical way in our lives? There's five ways here. So first, by watching us glorify God rather than ourselves. People will see something different in us. Secondly, we glorify God and enjoy him by functioning as we were designed. He created us to do something. Sometimes you look at an, a, a most amazing car, like this most beautiful Ferrari or something. We don't think so much of the car as being glorified, but we think of the, the brain that designed that vehicle. And so we should be making people... Think about God when they see us as God's children behaving in, uh, in a good way. Third, we glorify God. Whoops. Third, we glorify God by being productive. We were created to produce. It was a directive from God. <clears throat> we, we see so much in the world, and this is a problem in Africa, is people want something for nothing. They don't kind of get this. So... I get some uh, WhatsApp text after that, that last one and from a couple of different pastors, and they said, you know what, we are really grateful that we've never heard anything like this before. I've gotten that everywhere I've gone now, so I'm, I'm excited about that. You know, God put something in my head that was kind of new. And, uh, but, it's, uh, but then again, it's not. But these people are encouraged and really challenged 
So if you think about it, just pray for these people that, you know, God will keep working in them. They're fighting a tough, a tough battle. They're trying to reach people who are enticed by money um, in the prosperity churches and by these Muslims who are trying to buy people all the time. And like Asaf said, he said, these people are all lost and they don't even know it. Um, because, and that's one of the, 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 the things that I saw that poverty has the greatest impact because everybody wants to have a good life. I mean, they want to be able to take care of their kids. They want to educate their kids. They want their kids to grow up and be able to have a good life. They want good health care when they can get it. And so they, they live with this, like, uh, this constant sense of, of um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're just kind of frustrated where, where they're at, knowing that there's something better because they've seen it. The problem is they're looking in the wrong place. And so that's kind of what we're trying to help people get uh, pointed in the right direction and why I'm so glad to meet Asaf because he already got this he actually wrote to me He said how did you convince these people in Cameroon? You know about this idea. I said well, I didn't I said God brought them to me. They already had the idea. I said just like you <laughs> So God's already working in the hearts uh, of, of some of these people and um, And again because of your prayers because of your financial support We've been able to kind of do this and it's starting to really bear fruit and I'm excited. I hope you're excited too and uh, So a fourth way of glorifying God is by translating and teaching God's Word so that people can apply it as was mentioned this morning with Bill and Kathy in Senegal and fifth, we glorify God by taking responsibility for our world. That's one of the things that I think disappoints me more than anything in this country. Um, everywhere we look around where we live, there's jobs for hire. I mean, people looking for, for employees. I ran into, uh, Ellen and I ran into uh, one of our old neighbors the other night, and he works for um, Mackey Lumber, which is a large lumber distributor up in Northern Mass. And they have their own window shop, door shop, trust shop, and he's in charge of the whole thing. He said, I got a core group of a couple of people that have been there for years. He said, the rest is a revolving door. Says these people come in, they want a job, and they find out they have to work, and they're gone. And uh, he said, it's, it's really, really horrible. He says, I, he's, he's, what did he say, he was 64. He said, a couple of years to retire. But he's actually anxious to retire, even though he loves his job, because it's just the frustration. But God created us to take responsibility, go to work, get a job. I mean, there are people who can't work, and we understand that, and we have a responsibility to care for those people. But at the same time, God created us to participate with him in caring for the world and caring for other people through that. So there's a picture of one mosque. I, I tried to snap a couple. And if you note, the buildings are quite ornate. And one of the things that happened while we were in Cameroon is uh, there was some conjoined twins. And I don't know what the connection was between the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Board and these hospitals in Saudi Arabia. But in the Saudi Arabian government said, send them here. And they, um, they did the operation, separated the twins. We happened to be in the airport the day they were returning from Saudi Arabia. And um, I forget whether we were coming or going at the time, but we were there, and we saw our boss there, a uh, guy who was the <clears throat> director of health services, and these people came out with gifts like you couldn't imagine. I mean, strollers and every kind of baby toy and, and stuff that you could imagine. But the agreement was, is they would do the operation for free if they were allowed to build a mosque in their village. And so, you know, Saudi Arabia, these oil-rich countries have a lot of money, and they're spending it on missions. Uh, it's not what we think of as missions, but they're bribing people who are suffering financially by saying, hey, join our church. We'll give you money. We'll give you food. And, uh, yeah, Satan's hard at work. So here's <clears throat> the verse. Second Corinthians 10, 17. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. So after our mission director said that, I have a sense of freedom in boasting of what the Lord is doing. And I said, this is great timing because we're going to Sharon because these people pray constantly for their missionaries. We know that. And Laura writes every month, what can we pray for? And uh, so I'm going to read this. So these are all comments from Asaf as he's been reading through my book. 
and also expressing to him. So listen carefully. There's some things in here that we've always known that are kind of disturbing to know, um, but it's good to know so we can be praying about them. And that was part of the idea. Now also, don't be offended by the word regarding race of white and black because it's very, in, in, it's not like a negative thing in Africa. It means you know the difference. So he uses that, talks about um, white people. Um, referring to us, but because we're white. So, so um, I am on page 36 of your book, and there is a lot to react about. The amazing truth is that you did a lot to study the culture of Africans, and if God can only give you people who are trustworthy to foster change in our society, then the work will be easy. But who are those who have understood our problem? Many Africans pretend a lot about missionaries since their target is money. Some even say, let them go away and we get back to our system. Oh God, but who is the loser? The one who remains with his poverty because he has rejected knowledge. I was talking to someone who was part of my team, who I will not name here. I said that the program you have brought is very good and it will take us to another level of ministry if we rise up to it, since we understand our culture and our problem. However, the person responded by telling me that the program is good, but it's not what, and he was talking about church leaders are looking for. People need partners who, will, uh, who want to support their ministries, and so it's not good for Ugandan pastors. This is someone who has worked beside me to put the ministry right, but when he undermined the idea, I asked myself, who else in my circle will understand it? However, I said, I will go that way and the others will follow me, no matter how long it will take me. I said this because what I, is known in our country is that the big bishops, these are those big church leaders, with big churches are stealing a lot of money from the West and the pastors we visit in these village districts wonder why I've not taken that path. Some say that I waste whites because I don't know what to do with them. How can, you work, how can you work with whites for more than three years and remain poor? Because of that thinking, some of these people come to our meetings to get contacts and put you to good use because I am wasting you. And the word you preach is truth that can lead to real transformation, but very few are willing to settle for it. Many actually oppose any gospel that is not characterized with miracles and prosperity, and that is a big problem here. But I tried, and I'm trying to penetrate the culture by begging with a timeline study, that's the one I mentioned earlier, the timeline um, of salvation, which draws many to do their own research and the desire to study their Bibles, from which I have seen some wake up to the truth. The book, though, I have not read all pages, puts a big difference between the God we preach in Sub-Saharan Africa and what others preach. The fruit we bear clearly explains the type of vine we come from, no doubt. A bad tree will bear bad fruit, and a good tree will bear good fruit. Your book is a life to live and the moral values, not only solving a puzzle of development, but will also lead to transform families and a means to raise Christians who will endure to eternal inheritance. Many can be saved, but few will be redeemed. I have been quoting your words always as I talk to many people these days, and the book almost has become my gospel. One may think that the book has become my Bible just because it's the life a Christian must live. It gets out the life of Christ from the book to a real lifestyle to live. And first picking it away at it from the puzzle of development to a pathway to heaven. That is why I'm thinking to first distribute the book for free because it's full of life leading to eternal inheritance. This is because many missionaries have come here, many churches and theological seminaries have been established, and many believers are seen attending church today, but very few in Sub-Saharan Africa will prove what they claim to be. How many believers are living the life? And I, and I need to be quoted well, as I am not saying that it's a gospel of works. However, faith without works is dead, or no faith at all. Glory be to God for his grace that have been able to read your book. My mindset, my lifestyle, and my ministry is tremendously changing. <clears throat> I am very good at reading books, but whenever I give time to read with much desire, I just understand that the Lord is intending something for me. 
for the vision of Converge to have a great impact within pastors in Uganda, this book should be considered on the front line. Kind of got a kick out of that. Do you know that in a few years to come, I will be a far better believer, leading by example, and many will be impacted? You, you guys are responsible for that. And uh, I am really thrilled by that. You know, there were many times as I was writing this thing, am I doing the right thing? And uh, as I can now look back, and this is what I've encouraged people um, so many times, it came up in Kenya that until we surrender to the Lord, you know, I shared how I had a construction company, Ellen had her own house cleaning business. It was only because we had an argument one day and I was teaching through the, uh, this thing, uh, um, a study on the Sermon of the Mount and preparing a Sunday school lesson every week. My business was running my life. Um, it was creating tension between me and Ellen. Um, I had very little time. And uh, when we had this argument this night, I just prayed and I said, Lord, you know what? I like doing what I'm doing, but my priorities in my life are totally messed up and I need to get them in order. So he sent us to Cameroon, and that was like his answer, and it turns out that God wanted to do better things with us. And uh, when we got to Cameroon, Ellen hated it there for like the first six weeks. She struggled. It was hard. I mean, there was no way to shop. Um, we had vegetables to live on, banana bread and cheese for what, like three weeks. <laughs> and I mean, for a woman, it was really hard trying to figure out how to live. And I would say, you know, what can I do? Because I'm loving it there. And, uh, and she said, get me a plane ticket home. And I mean, it was like the worst thing I wanted to hear. And, but she was reading a book at the time. Um, what was the name of that book? Pursuing the Will of God. And she said she would read it and she'd throw the book down. She'd read it, throw the book down. And uh, in the meantime, this young, young kid came to the house every day. He had um, osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection. He had a chunk of bone removed, so he was there for a long time. He came every day and knocked on the door and said, Ma, teach me to read. And every day she would say, I'm not a teacher. <laughs> After six weeks, and her reading the book, she shared with me later, is that she put the book down, she got down on her knees and said, Lord, I hate it here, and you know that, and I'm struggling. And I know that you've called us here. What do you want me to do? And then she thought of this kid. So the next day he came, he said, she said, well, come tomorrow. And that night she says, how do you teach kids to read? <laughs> so he came the next day with two, his brother and sister, came the next day with four more kids. In two weeks, she had 25 children. She actually wrote her own curriculum. Then when she came back, she took this Tassal course and went back, ended up starting a school. Um, many kids, 12, 13 years old, started at the school and couldn't even write their names. And many of them now, a lot of our friends on Facebook, they've been through university, engineers, nurses, all kinds of people. So God is not looking for willing, I mean, uh, for qualified people, but he's looking for people. And this, this just jumped in my head in, when I was in Kenya because the pastor was talking about surrender. And I said, you know, it wasn't until I surrendered my business to the Lord in my life and said, you do with it. And she surrendered her life and said, Lord, I hate it here, but you do it. That... Um, God just did amazing things that we never would have imagined after that. So it basically has nothing to do with us, which I think is really cool. And, um, and it has a lot to do with the prayers of his people, the way he's brought together churches that have supported us. And it's important for you to know that, that God is working through, through those things. When you pray, God is answering those prayers. And um, so anyway, I just really want to thank you for that and uh, appreciate you for that. So as we boast what the Lord is doing, to your boast as well. So let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just, uh, we just love you, and we love the way that you love us and the way that you want to use us, regardless of the fact that we are really nobodies and we have nothing, and everything that we have that is of any value comes from you. We just pray that uh, we would each just consider the things that God has given us, the places that you've put us, um, where you want us to be your light shining in the darkness and as you shine your light on us as we read your word um, as your spirit speaks to our hearts we just pray that you would just give us opportunities and uh, and boldness and courage to be that light shining we just pray especially 
um, with thanksgiving for churches like Hope Church here in Sharon that uh, is so committed to people knowing you, to people who are lost in the darkness, and pray that you would continue to, to bless them as they bless others um, for your glory. And we just commit all this into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.